Today we are in the State House cafeteria uh, looking at our March show here. Um, as many folks probably know, during the legislative session we rotate each month a new show here through the cafeteria. Uh, this month we have a show that's being put on by Vermont After School. Uh, Vermont After School is a public-private statewide partnership that's dedicated to supporting and sustaining uh, innovative learning opportunities that extend beyond the school day for, for all Vermont's uh, children and Vermont's youth. Um, and their activities are really directed toward increasing the quality and availability of educational programs during non-school hours. Um, their mission statement is to support organizations in providing quality after-school, summer, and expanded learning experiences so that Vermont's children and youth have the opportunities, skills, and resources they need to become healthy, productive members of society. And there's a, a great range of artwork that's here. I'll, I'll um, read to you what the information is about this particular show. Uh, it's called Youth Voice in the Third Space. And uh, Vermont After School states that youth expression is important and often overlooked. Um, this show here in the cafeteria highlights work from young people across the state of Vermont, ages 6 to 18. Um, so there's a, a broad range of, of young artists here, budding artists. Um, each piece of artwork was created in what they call the third space of learning, uh, which is when youth aren't at home or at school. So for every hour in school, young people spend five hours in their third space. And uh, it's, important, it's an important place for them to learn learn new skills and have opportunities for creative expression. Artwork in this show was made at after school programs, teen centers, community art centers, and during summer programs. So this art comes from uh, a broad number of students from a broad number of places around the state of Vermont. Um, and again, it is elementary school age students right up through high school students. There's some really incredible work here. Uh, paintings, drawings, uh, a little bit of, of everything as you might imagine. Um, various things out of kids' imaginations, various things that are more real. Um, some incredible artwork of, uh, of wildlife here. There are some really neat, um, I believe they're first graders that did self-portraits here in, in a really creative and interesting way. Um, and so there's a, a lot of different pieces here that represent uh, a lot of different kids' interests and uh, a lot of different levels and skills of artwork. And I think the really great thing about this show is, again, it was an opportunity that kids had to do something different, to do something creative um, outside of the school or the home. And um, it's, a, it's a show that will be up for this month. There's going to be at the end of the day, late afternoon, um, um, on the 28th of March is actually going to be a reception here uh, where folks can stop in and, and meet some of these budding artists, some of these kids, and just have a chance to celebrate the work that they've done here and the work that the Vermont After School Program does. Uh, so if you do find yourself in the cafeteria in the month of March, I would encourage you to, to take a few minutes, take a walk around, and see these great pieces that the kids have done and that we're uh, very pleased and, and honored to show here in the, in the State House for this month. Hi, my name is Sharon Fagard. I represent the towns of Highgate, Franklin, Berkshire, and Richford, along with Lisa Hango. And uh, town meetings were, I thought, pretty good last, uh, last week. Uh, covered a lot of ground. I'm in the Agriculture and Forestry Committee. And uh, some of the things that we've been doing are we have been clarifying some of the sales tax exemptions for forest, uh, forestry products. There's been some confusion, so we've been working to tighten that up. Uh, we have a house cleaning bill that does a number of things um, that are so varied <laughs> and so different that it would be hard to cover that. Um, but when that is finalized, I'll be, I would be happy to talk about that at a later time. Um, one of the issues that is a pet project of mine is H-235, which uh, initially um, I introduced it to repeal the sunset on on-farm slaughter in order to support small farms having an option uh, to sell whole animals and make some money off of their livestock. And there are some challenges with that. For instance, current law only allows one person to purchase each animal. Um, and, and whole as a live critter, um, which is great. You know, I sell sheep, but if you're trying to sell uh, beef, very few people actually have the freezer space or the ability to consume a whole beef. Uh, but I knew that would be a large um, challenge to get through the Agency of Agriculture and Food and Safety. So my bill just repeals the sunset, but it looks like probably it will just uh, push the sunset out four years.
but that keeps the door open and it allows for some organizations to do the necessary outreach and education, which the agency of ag hasn't really been doing that would make sure that uh, farmers are registering and reporting their activities because one of the arguments for not allowing that um, the the uh, extension of the, of the sunset is because there hasn't been much in the way of registering and reporting. We have pollinator protection bill and that covers a lot of issues. It would ban the retail sale and use of neonicotinoids but still permit it for coated seeds for the corn and soy that's grown in the state um, and uh, licensed applicators, so professional applicators that might be treating um, ash trees against the emerald ash borer or managing golf courses. And it would also require registering of uh, hive, hive locations and uh, provide for education because varroa mite has been such a a major issue and we are learning now that uh, some of the colony collapse that we've seen is often due to the viruses that the varroa spreads and the varroa as well as those viruses are infecting our native pollinators as well. So that's probably all I have to say for now. Thank you. Hello, my name is Cynthia Browning. I am state representative for Bennington 4 District. That's the district that includes Arlington, Manchester, Sandgate, and Sunderland. What I'd like to talk about today is something called unfunded pension liabilities. And I know that as soon as I say that, you closed your eyes and like glazed over, all right? But this is incredibly important. I have constituents asking me all the time, we need to spend more money on weatherization in order to save energy and help low-income Vermonters. We need to spend more money on child care for the same reasons. We need to spend more money on economic development in order to raise everybody up. We need to spend more money on X, Y, or Z, and you probably have your own list. I also hear from constituents who say, please don't raise my taxes. Please don't raise my taxes. Now you may be wondering, since the economy is growing and that means that tax revenue from the income tax and the sales tax is growing, you may be thinking, why aren't we able to do these things? Well, something is eating the budget. And that something is the unfunded pension liabilities. So even though it sounds like accountant geek talk, this is incredibly important. What it is, is the state has pension funds for the state employees and also for teachers. Even though teachers work for the school districts, teachers' retirement has been administered and funded by the state since 1947. So the problem with these funds is that we haven't put enough money in them in decades past. So now that many baby boomers like myself are getting ready to retire, there isn't enough money in them. Not only that, Every time the accountants look at the fund, they may see, well, you know, these baby boomers are living longer than we thought. I personally intend to live forever. But they're living longer than we thought. They're going to collect their pensions longer. They're earning more money right before they retire, which means their pensions are bigger. And also, we've been investing this fund money, but we're not earning the level of returns we thought we would. So what they do is they tell the state, you have to put more money in these pension funds. It's a form of debt. It's like paying down your credit card debt. Imagine if somebody could just come in and say, you know, actually your credit card debt is twice as big as you thought it was, even though you didn't charge anything else. That's what's happening to the state. So the state is having to put more and more of our revenue into funding these unfunded pension liabilities because we are legally obligated to make those payments now and for, you know, into the future. We have a schedule, we're trying to pay down the obligation, but it means that when revenue grows, most of that increase in revenue has to go to the pension liabilities. So there's nothing left for the natural increases in cost, the natural increases in allocations to things like child care or weatherization that we might want to do. So then people start saying you have to raise taxes. But revenue is growing. Why do we need to ta raise taxes on everybody because of the pension funds? So my solution, and you know I would have a suggestion, <laughs> which would be quite controversial. My idea is that the state employees and the teachers will benefit from these funds. They've already contributed to them as part of their you know, salaries and everything. But we are now in a crisis, and I can't see raising taxes on all Vermonters or cutting back on the services and investments that all Vermonters need 
because of this unfunded liability. So I think that teachers and the state employees need to share in the burden of solving it. And I have a bill, H447, I think it is, which would impose a 1% tax on both the compensation and the benefits of state employees and teachers. So this would not generate a great deal of revenue. Um, it might be, you know, 12 million or 15 million a year. But if you put an additional 15 million into the unfunded pensions every year, you will reduce the future obligations by 45 million and 50 million because anything put in now is going to be invested and earn interest. So anything we can put in now is going to help. Now I understand that state employees and teachers would not want to do this, and I get that. Um, an alternative would be to renegotiate the structure of their benefits with them to try to reduce them. But we've done that in the past, and it didn't always really make that much difference. So to my mind, we would never have promised the benefits that they now have if we knew how much it would cost now. So we all need to figure out how to contribute to paying down this obligation. All Vermonters are already doing so with multiple, many millions and millions of dollars from the general fund. And I think it's time for state employees and teachers to kick in as well. We cannot tolerate this constant revision upwards of this debt. It's going to mean that Vermont cannot grow, cannot take care of its citizens, cannot take care of the environment. And I find that intolerable. I don't like raising taxes. I don't want to raise taxes. But these are the groups that benefit from it. And the taxes they would pay would go directly into the fund. So it's Essentially, they're paying for their own benefits, and that's what my proposal is to try to solve this problem and to try to make it so that Vermont can take care of its citizens and do what needs to be done. We all need to share in this burden, and I think that the beneficiaries of these programs need to kick in more. Thank you. Hi, this is State Representative Brian Savage from Swanton, representing Franklin 4, which is uh, Sheldon in Swanton, located in Franklin County. Uh, today is uh, Wednesday, March the 13th. It is the second day uh, we've been in session since the um, town meeting break that was last week. Um, so we're getting back into the swing of things, but this is also what is known as crossover week. And that's where uh, a bill needs to clear its, um, uh, if it's going to be considered, needs to clear its uh, uh, first committee of jurisdiction that it was assigned to. So the um, uh, by five or by the close of business on Friday afternoon, and if it doesn't, then it's uh, put on the back burner until next year when it would have to be taken back up. So that's a, it's a pretty important date. So there's a, a lot of uh, going on, and people are working hard to get that uh, put in. Uh, I serve on the transportation committee, and on the committee we are um, doing the transportation bill uh, with a variety of it's a usual annual bill we do a transportation bill then we do the DMV bill um, and we're looking to uh, try to increase some funding to the um, towns for their state aid to highway uh, um, funds that are always there in desperate need uh, as we can well imagine this has been a very tough winter um, as w for the state uh, to take care of the state highways, but certainly uh, for our municipalities throughout the state as well. Uh, hopefully spring will be coming soon, and, but I think there's going to be a lot of repair work that has to be done after, uh, after the snow and ice are over. Um, and uh, I know that the uh, House Ways and Means and the House Appropriations, the money committees, uh, are hard at work also. The, um, uh, they have got a reprieve because they're in a money committee situation, so they get an extra week before it's their cutoff or their crossover, uh, but they're fast at work doing that, so it will remain to be seen what happens there. So that pretty well sums it up, and I'm going to be leaving this spot right now and heading up to my transportation committee room. Thank you. Hi, this is Representative Brian China from Burlington, Vermont, and I'm going to speak with you today about a bill, H3, which is an act relating to ethnic and social equity studies standards for public schools. And today, um, this bill passed out of the House on a unanimous voice vote, and it's on its way to the governor. Um, this is a bill that built on efforts that go back to last year, um, efforts of a coalition that is working on ethnic and, and social equity study standards for our schools. And uh, we tried in the last biennium, and the bill did not 
um, make it to the governor. So this year um, we tried again and it was a priority and it passed out of the House, um, went over to the Senate, was amended um, in a minor way in, um, in collaboration with the coalition and came back and passed unanimously out of the House. Um, so what the bill will do is um, bring together a group to look at the curriculum in our schools and look at how the curriculum can be more inclusive and can include the perspectives of people from different ethnic backgrounds, different racial backgrounds, um, different immigrant status, um, different you know disability and abilities, um, different social groups such as LGBTQ youth and women, um, and really looking at how to um, how to provide a, a richer curriculum to our children. Um, and, you know, the bill promises to really uh, improve the experience in our schools for future generations um, by giving a richer portrayal of our history and, um, and by creating a more inclusive curriculum, it also creates a more inclusive culture in our schools where all children will feel valued and where all people's contributions to our society will be valued. Hi, I'm Senator Randy Brock. I represent Franklin County and the town of Alberg in Grand Isle County in the Senate. Uh, today I want to just talk for a second about a Bill S-37 that relates to the release of uh, what are called toxic uh, substances uh, into uh, uh, possibly uh, people ingesting. Uh, this is a bill that uh, came up for second reading uh, preliminary approval in the Senate today uh, and it won approval at a vote of 21 in favor and 8 opposed. I was one of the 8 who was in opposition and it was a bipartisan group of 8 who opposed the bill. Let me tell you some of the reasons why I oppose it. The bill is very broad in nature. It establishes what's called strict liability for any chemical release uh, and holds uh, the company, and generally it's large companies that would be most impacted by this, uh, responsible. The problem is it holds them responsible indefinitely into the future, even for acts that today may be perfectly legal. In other words, if there's a release of any substance that today meets best practices, meets all federal and state environmental rules, it still presents an exposure into the future, even if there's no negligence involved on the part of the company. Uh, I believe that this is going to have a very serious uh, deleterious effect on business activity in Vermont going forward. I think it also will have a very bad effect on insurance and the ability for uh, companies to even get insurance that would protect against toxic waste. This is probably the, the biggest uh, potential damage that we can see to economic development, in my opinion, uh, going forward because Vermont at this point would be the only state in the nation that has a law like this. We have laws right now that protect us for improper discharges. We have laws that protect us from, from negligence and uh, uh, from damage to people through companies doing things wrong. This is a bill that was opposed by virtually every economic development organization in Vermont, ranging from the Lake Champlain Regional Chamber of Commerce to the Addison County Chamber uh, to the Central Vermont Chamber to uh, organizations uh, such as Associated Industries of Vermont uh, and the Barry Granite Association and large farm organizations. Uh, I think that this is a bill that uh, can be very, very hurtful and although it's designed to protect people, I think it will do just the opposite because it will make companies not be able to insure against events that they ought to be able to at least to some extent protect against. It also provides for medical monitoring even for people who are not really injured as a result uh, of this but of potential injury because of something that may in very, very large quantities potentially cause an injury but who are exposed to tiny quantities. All in all, I think this is a bad bill, and that's why I voted against it. I'm Senator Jenny Lyons, Chair of Health and Welfare Committee in the Senate, and I represent Chittenden County. We've had a very busy year this year in our Health and Welfare Committee. We started the year out by looking at uh, prior authorization for medical ass assisted treatment. Uh, for patients and we have removed that prior authorization so it makes it easier for clinicians to make a, uh, a prescription for folks who have finally come to a realization that they would like to kick their addiction. 
So this is a real step forward for those people. Um, we're up, we've also worked a, a great deal on prevention. You know, addiction comes in many forms and many different types of substances. So we began by looking at what could we do for prevention of marijuana addiction, prevention of tobacco, alcohol, and or so building a system and a program that addresses addiction generally. And as part of that, um, we passed the Tobacco 21 bill, so that now that you must be the age of 21 to purchase tobacco products or uh, vaping products. Some, some people call them Juul. We had some terrific testimony from students from some of the high schools in the rural areas of the state. They indicated to us that by changing the age to 21, it would take tobacco products and jewel out of the hands of kids who are school aged. They wouldn't, their 18 year old peers wouldn't be bringing those things to kids who are younger. We feel very comfortable with that as an important prevention piece. And then we've also looked at some of the larger committees and councils that we have had in the state. So the Tobacco Evaluation Review Board or the Governor's Opioid Council, we've consolidated those into one very uh, uniform uh, organization, so a committee, a council uh, within the Department of Health with people who have understanding and credentials or research savvy about um, addiction and how to how to build prevention that bill is now in appropriations and it will really change the configuration of prevention in the agency of human services now we'll have a director uh, with a with a degree and credentials who can do the work for, within the department and people will have um, an understanding of how communities can link in with our government offices to find grants or to identify what are known as evidence-based programs, programs that actually work uh, to prevent um, addiction. So we, we uh, continue to do our work in that area. We're excited about that bill. Uh, some other things that we're working on and have passed out as bills uh, are the toxic chemicals in children's products. Uh, we've modified that program to make it more uh, streamlined and efficient for the Department of Health uh, and for parents who want to understand what is in the, what are, what's in the toys that they're buying for their kids. So um, that, that, that's a bill that's been around uh, before. We've modified it a little bit and we certainly hope that it, as it leaves the Senate, it will go to the House and eventually to the Governor. One of the bills I think that's really um, most exciting is our dental bill where we have increased the benefit to um, Medicaid patients for dental coverage. So instead of paying for two visits to the dentist, two preventive uh, visits to the dentist, uh, patients will now go, um, have the cleaning done, have the x-rays done, have that initial investigation complete, and then Medicaid coverage will begin for uh, things like extraction or filling cavities and, and restoration. That's so important. We've heard that this is really important for people, uh, especially those in a lower income area. When they, when they go for jobs, they want to be able to smile. And uh, so we're, we're very happy about sending that bill out. We do hope that it can be funded appropriately so people will be able to access the dental services that they need. So those are a few of the things that we've done in health and welfare. We're looking forward to continuing our work on our constitutional amendment for reproductive liberty, and um, which would be, which will take three or four years uh, first go through this biennium, then the next biennium. So we'll be hopefully voting that out um, and presenting it to the full Senate very soon. Um, and I'm happy to report on that another time. So thank you all, and it's been a pleasure to be here. Mm -hmm.